I'm B.A. Leipa and I'm the Pro-Rector at Aarhus University and have the pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome you all to this webinar. It is a personal pleasure uh, because today we are having two of my favorite organizations together. Both the Guild and Chef work to advance and acknowledge uh, the value of higher education. And uh, CERN, if you put on the slides, please, then uh, I'll just take, if we take uh, slide number two, say a few words about the Guild. Uh, it was founded in 2016. It is a network made up of 21 research intensive European universities. You can see the names here on the slide with the mission of pursuing excellence in both research and education. And it is blessed with a very good office run by General Secretary Jan Palmovsky and a good team, among whom Ivana, who just uh, greeted you, are supporting, or were supporting the creation and dissemination of the paper reimagining research led higher education in a digital age. That is the paper that is on the agenda of today's webinar. This paper was written in collaboration between four Guild members. Some of you already heard that Joe Angori from University of Warwick was the writer, and Aune Valke from University of Tartu, Karin Amos from University of Tübingen, and myself supported with inputs of various kinds. Uh, we are all four here today. But a paper is not worth much if it is not read, criticized, and taken further like any other academic contribution. So I'm therefore very, very grateful that Chef at the School of Education at Aarhus University immediately volunteered to host today's seminar. That is the second seminar following the launch of the paper. And if you will take the next slide, CERN, Chef is something very special to me and to Aarhus University. My first thought when describing CHEF is that it is like participating or becoming a member of a big family. Those of you who, who uh, came in early, I think, got that feeling. But more officially, CHEF is the acronym for Center of Higher Education Futures. It is a center for research on higher education and universities future. And importantly, also for a dialogue between both national and international researchers and policymakers. And if you allow me to use that analogy of a family, then the co director Søren Benson and Sue Wright are the very proficient parents. Sorry for that, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> but I, Søren and Sue, you can describe yourself and the sense of much better. Because now I am happy to leave the floor to Søren who will chair us through the next couple of hours. Søren, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Beat. Uh, it's a great pleasure for Chef to collaborate with you and the Guild, and um, we look very, very much forward to, to the discussion today. And just to add uh, to your uh, very generous introduction that um, Chef is a research center at the Danish School of Education, and you can read more uh, on our website here about the different events that we organize each semester, um, the different projects that we lead on and that we co-lead or are part of. So, and you can become a member also uh, by signing up. So yeah, you're very much uh, welcome. Let me just say a few words about the program. Um, and the first speaker is um, the co-director also of CHEF, Professor Susan Wright. So shortly she will um, give a talk on educational challenges in relation to uh, today's topic. And after Sue's talk, there will be um, time for a couple of questions. So if you come to think, think of anything, let me know in the chat and I can uh, just put in an X and I can see who wants to say something, um, ask a question or, or have a comment and I'll bring you in. And after Sue's presentation, uh, Beard will give a talk on standards, a balancing act. And after Beard's presentation, there will be another opportunity for a brief discussion. Then we'll have a break. Um, and after the break, we'll try really to engage in a, a community building because that's so important from the Guild, which is very inspiring for us as well. Um, so Sue will start us off by introducing the sort of framing questions and the framing ideas uh, behind that exercise. And then we'll divide you into 
uh, breakout rooms so you can discuss with colleagues here today. And uh, there will be a Padlet as well where, where you can write and insert some of your notes. So we have them for later. Um, and then we'll ask each group to just give a brief summary. Uh, I'll tell you more about later on. And we'll end with a few suggestions for how to take this further, some ideas and initiatives for further collaboration together, because we really want to hope to build on this event and maybe to work on the same theme, but in other formats uh, or in follow-up webinars. And um, around four o'clock, no later, it will say goodbye again. So uh, I think it's over to you now, Sue, actually for your presentation. Um, Professor Susan Wright, co-director of Chef. Okay, and you'll do the slides. Great, thank you. So I've spent a very enjoyable time reading the Guild's report, Reimagining Research-Led Education in a Digital Age. And they set out a number of, of educational challenges, which we've discussed within CHEF. And so this is really the, the uh, highlights of that discussion. If you go to the next slide. The first one is the broadening mandate of universities. From uh, about 2000 with the Lisbon strategy, uh, the mandate of universities was really narrowed down to the idea that they were supporters or drivers of a global knowledge economy. And education also became heavily linked to the notion of employability. But now increasingly there is a widening of that mandate with the um, crises that face Europe and the globe the climate change, the global inequalities, the massive population movements that are happening around the world and the threat to democracy and uh, of course the pandemics. So the idea is that uh, the university should have a broader mandate and students should be equipped to handle all those challenges of the future. The Guild paper says that this requires providing students with, and I like this phrase, analytical skills for complex inquiry. And they identify three things there. One is students should be engaged in actual research projects, working collaboratively with academics. And this is something I've spent my life trying to develop. So much of university education is research informed education, but how do we actually develop educational programs where students are active researchers, active members of a research community. The second point then is the issue of, about translating disciplinary knowledge into interdisciplinary contexts. Of course, this is a very vexed discussion whether we should focus on disciplines, whether we should start students off with interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approaches. I still I'm old fashioned enough to, to think that having a disciplinary base is a good start, but it's really important that they don't get siloed into one discipline. How do they work across disciplines? The third point is then, and I think this is crucially important too, students learning depends on a lot of time to reflect and think about what they're taking in, what they want to do with that knowledge, how they can use it creatively, but also there's an emphasis on uh, education addressing and acting on real problems. And there's a tension between the time needed for reflection and the urgency of action. So that raised a question for us, how to work flexibly adapting to emergent issues within this broad mandate and abide by nationally accredited, delivered and regulated educational models and sustain international standards of quality and comparability. And this is where the notion of, of standards begins to come in. Are those standards helping us or are they hindering us? Can we go to the next slide? The second challenge is that of mobility. The EU uh, in it, its uh, recent uh, educational strategy says that we should aim for 50% of students having a, an experience of studying abroad by 2025. At the moment, it's much less than that. The pandemic, of course, has prevented actual mobility, but it's also provided experience, some of it good and some of it not so good, of virtual mobility and of internationalization at home. So the, the 
both the, the EU and also the Guild paper is arguing that more diversified mobility experiences are needed, not least for students from underprivileged backgrounds who are underrepresented in the traditional mobility models and in the Erasmus programme at the moment. So that raises the question, how do we develop educational programs that combine virtual mobility, internationalization at home and actual mobility, or do we go for one or the other? How can students' experiences of mobility be evaluated in, all that, in those different ways? And then there's a second one, which especially affects us in Denmark. How can universities handle the tensions when international and national missions are pointing in different directions? For example, if a national priorities are to ration resources on international education and focus resources instead on the local labor market and the local language. So there's a lot of issues there. And of course, standards and criteria tend to push us in one direction or another. Can we go to the next slide, Sen? Oh, just before we do, that little snail, comes from a, a report uh, we did here at CHEF on uh, uh, early stage researchers experiences of mobility who were part of uh, the EU ITN projects and we had this fantastic quote from one of the one of the participants obviously there was great excitement about the opportunities of mobility but she says I'm like a snail I just have to have my whole home on my back so the the, the effect of um Mobility actually on students' lives is another issue that needs to be taken into account. Now we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and this is the third challenge that uh, we picked up, which is how to generate collaboration across boundaries. Um, if you think of university research, we've long been involved in collaboration between academics across institutional boundaries and across national boundaries, and we hardly think about it. The EU strategy for European universities, I think it's called European University Alliances at the moment, envisages similar networks of academics and students teaching and learning across institutional and national boundaries. And that's a different mindset for education. So the question then is raised, how do we move on from the Bologna process, which provided tools for comparability of education across Europe, and instead build to tools for collaboration between institutions across Europe. They were the three things that I wanted to raise, the three challenges that I, I feel are really important. Um, and we could open it up for questions now, if you like, so. Yes, let's definitely, let's definitely do that. And maybe just to add one tiny thing, when you talk about mobility, so we have also discussed um, the dialogues and translations across uh, different institution levels within mm. one university. So when we talk about standards um, on a leadership level or strategic level, how does that translate um, into teaching and learning practices? Um, and how does that translate back again, perhaps? And those sort of dialogues within each context, which I think Beard will also mention a little bit more after, the, um, after this discussion. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And um, I think the, the Guild report uh, has some kind of phrasing about um, standards are often perceived or experienced as top-down impositions and time-consuming and meaningless. Um, and I think today what we're trying to do is open up the space to think about how could we develop standards that work for students and academics and obviously uh, leaders and decision makers across and that's why we're talking about creating a community. Definitely. Let's see if we can kickstart some of the discussion now already. Just um, if someone has a comment or question they would like to share with us, maybe an example from uh, their own institutional context. Um, Orna Volk has from... got a yeah. raised Alan? hand. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the... Uh, for the start, uh, opening up this, all these topics uh, that are really, really interesting in the paper, and um, uh, I just wanted to, I mean, to, to give a give a kick to the discussion and and uh, to, to your 
looking at your last slide about these tools for collaboration, I think it's very intriguing. It's really the question of what are the what are the things what to, across Europe we need in order to better better collaborate and and if we're looking at our uh, European uh, University Alliance, then then one of the main tools is connecting uh, digital um, uh, information of the universities and studies. I mean the so that the students can e easily be virtually mobile uh, and registered to the courses of the other uh, the other universities in the alliance. And this is where exactly I see the standards are coming in, because as soon as we start to um, digitally collaborate, we need standards, because otherwise in the real world, everybody can collaborate in a little bit different way, and it's okay. But as soon as we start digitally collaborating, we, we push standards, and, and I see, I mean, it's difficult because uh, academics and uni I mean, universities are different, uh, our countries are different, and, uh, and academics are so different and they are used to have their freedom. But at the same time, I, I see this as an opportunity to, to sort of, I mean, introduce kind of new ways of thinking and, and, and in, in this co collaboration, positive new ways of, or, or, or innovative new ways of, uh, of from the other countries. But it's, it's, what I foresee is this is a difficult place where we, the tools for collaboration uh, introduce standards that everybody is not sort of eager to eager to admit. Maybe <laughs> just yeah, a comment. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. if you feel the same or if you can respond, it's it's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Let's see if uh, Sue and, uh, has a comment and maybe. No, one. I think you're raising a really important point there, and I I think even if you're. I mean, I, I've just been trying to set up uh, some co-teaching uh, between Denmark and Australia, um, apart from the time scheduling, which is dreadful. But just what is a course? What is a module? Mm. <laughs> Everything's different. So to, it's a really fundamental thing to start thinking of education across borders. Yeah, I agree with you. And we definitely, I, I recall that we had some of these discussions as well when we prepared the webinar, that on the one hand, standards act as a bridge and a common language, and it's a way of connecting, it's actually a hook into another context that might be difficult to understand, so we create a common ground, but at the same time, it's detaching, and it's sort of um, making this sort of neutral, uh, not, not really real space, um, decontextualizing, so that's a really, really uh, difficult balance, I think. Bea, do, do we want to, uh, to come in as well? well no, I, I also uh, completely agree, and I think it's a great issue today because uh, somehow the how, where do we find the right balance between uh, actually having the same, being on the same uh, spot and just using the same language uh, uh, and what are the minimal standards we need and, and how do we also find the, the, the necessary flexibility? We have um, another comment and then we can see if there are others or we uh, move on to, to be it after. Uh, a comment from The Guild, it just says. Oh, sorry, you know. sorry, I need to change my name. I'm sorry, my, my name is Jan Pomoski. I'm, I'm uh, at The Guild. And I, I, so thank you, first of all, Susan, for this really uh, wonderful um, thought-provoking uh, thought opening. And there's so many things I'd love to come back on, but I was really struck by your, or was particularly struck by, um, so, so a specific and a general comment. So the specific comment is, is, was really about mobility and this question about is mobility a good thing? How, what, what is mobility? And when we think about the 50% clearly, and it goes back to the papers you mentioned that the, you know, we need to think about different way, connecting different ways of being mobile and being present. Mm. Um, and I, I, would, I would argue, and I ho hope we can also think about connecting mobility, not just to the institution, but also to the local environment. Mm -hmm. And and then, I mean, you also raised this question of measurement, you know, and, and one of the things I really wonder is how do we, what do different forms of mobility actually mean? What is the value that they actually add? And 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 how much about this do we know? Because, you know, if I, if I have Algebra 101 at Aarhus University, what is the value of that versus Algebra 101 that you mm -hmm. can teach with your Australian partner? You know, is mm -hmm. there any added value? I have, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So that's the... And, and, and so there is something really about measurement and about us being much clearer about 
articulating the value add in any given circumstance and then um, and then bring that also into the national conversation that we're in so that we actually also find ways then to connect these different kind of abilities to the local value add that also our politicians so, you know in some ways quite rightly also mm. so, so demand and the, and the more general comment that I have is that, that this is one example of the many things where we are in, it seems to me we're in quite an experimental space you know the mm. narrative mm. that you mentioned the societal need for what we do that you mentioned the opening up and so I wonder how we can get you know I, I'm one of those people I totally recognize what you said about quality assurance being something done to me <laughs> as an academic I mean oh um, and it's about filling in forms, et cetera. So how can we move towards an, an enabling framework? If we think about all the things that we don't know right now, how can we find ways to maybe start kind of in a broad way because we don't know, um, and then slowly building up an experience to find more common ways, if you see mm. what I mean. So mm. maybe starting in a more trust-based way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I just... Jan, you're absolutely, I mean, this is what we want to do in the group work towards the end of this okay. session. So you've set the scene beautifully. I mean, that is exactly what we want to do is open up that experimental space, look for value instead of numbers mm. um, and uh, how we can actually look at, at um, the, the, the contextualized experience of education rather than some kind of currency that has... Um, enables us to move students around like ECTS you know we can say that's worth three or that's worth five but it doesn't actually mean anything in mm. terms of educational quality and it raises what you've been saying raises an even bigger problem which is there are no standards for educational quality there are no measures for educational quality in all of the auditing systems and uh, performance indicator systems there are only proxies so I think when you say it opens up a big space, I think it opens up an enormous space. Thanks a lot, Jan and Sue. Um, I can't see any further questions at this point. So maybe let's move on and uh, see if uh, more appear. Um, so it's a very great pleasure to hand it over now to Pro Rector of Aarhus University, Beat Aika. Um, and I will see if I can get into my slides again here. Thank, yes. thank you, sir, and, and thank you, Sue. I think I want to, to go further on your question about whether the time is ready now to move from comparability to collaboration. Uh, in these webinars, we dig further into and expand on, 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 on the, some of the issues of, of the, the paper, and today uh, I have asked uh, about mobility and standards, how do we find the balance? Because we never question internationalization when it's about research. I think research is by the nature, doesn't respect borders and crosses borders. But when it comes to education, it's a bit different. And, and we expand on the paper of some of the, those tensions between uh, local versus uh, global. Uh, education follows national regulations. Educational quality is largely something that we have national accreditation bodies or our own uh, quality assurance uh, at, uh, and funding uh, is uh, largely uh, a national business. And at the same time, we all acknowledge the enormous benefit of exposing students teach to other students, teachers and teaching in other countries. And I think it's not a coincidence that Erasmus is often described as the most successful EU activity. But recognition of study uh, elements acquired at uh, another university depends largely on, on having a mutual understanding of the value of that study element. And that's exactly what I want to, to, to try to, to dig into. Standards have therefore become uh, into common currency necessary for getting merits. And I will say that personally, having worked with education at Aarhus University for more than 20 years, this comes up again and again. Our academics really, really uh, worry whether their students get the necessary merits uh, when they, they go abroad. Uh, 
So what I will say also present later, standards comes with pros and cons, uh, and therefore is a balancing act to work with. Will you take the next slide, sir? In the paper, we say a little about quality standards. We have looked uh, also on everyday life where we rely heavily on standards. I mean, without standards, we could not, in example, trust taking prescribed medicine. And what about the vaccines? We all waited for the FDA, EMA, and our national bodies to approve that safety standards were met. So in the world of business, standardization is associated with something positive. And lack of st standards, I just uh, got a hybrid car. And the lack of standards for charging electrical car is certainly associated with extra costs and frustration, I would say, when I run around trying to find the right charger. Therefore, uh, demand for standards when it comes to products is often a driver for innovation. But will you take the next slide, turn? When it comes to educational quality, and Sue, you already uh, mentioned this, it's very difficult, different, and it's much harder, if at all possible, to apply standards uh, to and innovation. Uh, because quality, I usually say that quality, educational qualities make very simple and uh, all kinds of elaborate uh, definitions, but it is all about relationships between subject matter, uh, lecturers, teachers, and students. And I think the big question today is how do we apply standards and which standards do we apply? to advance uh, educational quality. I would uh, like shortly to, to address our current use of standards. Sue has already mentioned the ECTS and, and maybe Søren, if you will take the, the next uh, slide, because in the extension of the Bologna process, we got a number of standards, all with the aim of making mobility smooth and easy. You mentioned the European credit transfer system uh, that measures workload of students where one full time study year equals 60 ECTS credits. We also have the qualification framework with eight reference levels described in terms of learning outcomes for the comparison again between courses and also with the purpose of supporting cross-border mobility of students. And uh, when it comes to quality, well, it's very interesting. There it's explicitly said in the European Standards Guideline that this is not standards quality. I think they acknowledged that that was not possible. But, but still, it is a way of trying to make comparison easier. And on top of that, we have a number of national and institutional criteria for mobility and, and the mutual recognition. Would you take the, the next slide, please? So thus one can say that structurally, we are aligned uh, with ECTS and EQF. We are, uh, should be able to compare, but are we also uh, aligned in, when it comes to practice? I want to, to dig into when we students study at a, another university, uh, and I think this is even within a, the, the same country, what academic merits does a student get and what others, other merits, non-academic merits are acquired. If you will take the next, please. So if we go on, when you spend a semester or a shorter or longer uh, exchange at another uh, university, what I often have experienced is that the question, do students come home with sufficient academic merits? Interestingly, few uh, are worried about if they come home with more, but very often uh, you can even see that the same course uh, elicits two different numbers of, 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 of ECTS. Uh, in our administrative bilateral dialogues, we use ECTS to look for equivalence among courses, as was already mentioned. And if you click, um, it, if, if, yeah, please. Then 
I have just tried to, to illustrate this by taking, you can have 10 ECTS uh, courses. I just chose one example. It could be in educational philosophy at two different uh, universities, but they come with different content, different raw formats, and maybe even uh, different workloads. Some courses are easy to compare, often because the learning goals are uh, describing at a very general level, or uh, if they are electives, usually uh, academics care less if, if it's exactly equivalent. But there are other courses, especially as at professional programs, as medicine or law, that have very, very specific learning goals. And that is much more difficult to handle when it comes to marriage. And that's also why, where I personally have experienced as being a medical doctor and having worked for medical programs you wouldn't believe how uh, how much merit uh, depends on almost identical uh, course elements. So although uh, ECTS is a mutually accepted currency for workload, it also, and that's also where it comes in some of the, of the problems, it does differ from country to country. In some countries, one ECTS equals a workload of 25 hours in others, 30 hours. And as we all know, some people need less hours than others to complete a task. So that was sort of trying to problematize uh, one, one uh, way of, of comparison. And if you take the next slide, please, then I think there's another very interesting also question to ask, do we really count what matters? Uh, so we might be concerned about the academic payoff when students uh, go abroad, but I found it very interesting looking into different homepages of international centers. And, you know, they seldom describe the academic uh, outputs, but much more reasons for encouraging students to study abroad than other universities. And the arguments are almost... Uh, much more on all other benefits associated with an exchange. Maybe because we assume that the academic standards are secured by the ECTS. Um, I have here tried to list just some of the non-academic merits that are associated with internationalization, the, the curriculum. And if you ask students, they will come home, they could come home and say, well, I got a new network, got to learn new students, teachers, I got to, I looked in, I learned different ways of teaching, I uh, became better at French, uh, I were, were able to, I was able to, to access and, and get courses I would not otherwise have gotten, I had to change and, and be more adaptable to my way of learning, becoming more independent, I, something that almost is always mentioned if you talk to students returning, they will talk about the cultural awareness with all its, its uh, assets. And I think one of the discussions uh, we had to preparing this, one very important point was raised, uh, namely that uh, often we are very uh, focused on what the students get with him or her home, but we forget that they also might and should make a, a difference themselves being an ambassador of their country or will, will be. Um, so I, I really think that we, we have a number of standards, especially ECTS that have proven valuable for making mobility and collaboration possible by allowing for mutual uh, recognition. So, in other words, ECTS is the currency we use for the sake of mobility. But as I just said, we have at least two different challenges. First, ECTS measuring workload is a proxy for the academic uh, outcome at best. Secondly, we value the non-academic outcomes of mobility, but we don't uh, acknowledge them systematically or give merits. So, Sun, if you take the next slide, please. Uh, these challenges are not uh, 
limited to education or mobility. It also comes with opposite currencies. And then if I should say polemically, one can ask if we also need a Big Mac index that takes better into account the real goods that you get when you spend an ECTS. But let's soon move, because I know this would be provoking to ask something like this to the next. And I think last slide. Uh, I want to, to stress that the ECTS system has allowed us to mutually recognize study elements with the, it, all its, its, its back size. Uh, we can have our international offices arrange exchanges exactly because we have ECTS. However, in the leadership thought paper uh, we're presenting today, we asked if time has come to move towards more valid measures than workload. And this is cited from the paper. We write approaching educational achievement from the perspective of competences can provide ways to engage with content in a fresh and liberating way and constitute a second step in mutual recognition of educational achievement. Of course, there could be other ways than competences, but has the time come to move forward? And the very last, I think the point here is that rather than looking at our spent and the curriculum, we could look at the competences achieved. In other words, acknowledge that many roads lead to Rome, and are we ready to take that? Next and last, please. So, compasses is but one suggestion, and uh, in the following session, uh, we want to hear your voices on the pros and cons of standards, and maybe come up with uh, good solutions for how we can do move from from uh, comparison to collaboration. Thank you. Brilliant. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Beard. Just, uh, and I can see there are a few questions uh, in, in the chat. Just before that, uh, just to add, uh, because I really personally like your point about being an ambassador. We usually think about what we get to our institution, what we receive when students return, what they bring back to their own education, their further academic trajectories and to our institution. But what do they give to others? So that sort of um, gift giving or generosity, how do we prepare them? How do we send them out? Um, that's very rarely addressed, at least in, in my own uh, ex experience. So sort of turning, turning the tables around and, and think about uh, giving something instead of only uh, receiving in this perspective is, is very important, I think. And of course, the uh, tension between the formal curriculum and the informal curriculum, as you started out mentioning, is super interesting too. Let's hear what uh, people um, have to say. We still have some time for a little bit of discussion uh, before we uh, we move on. Uh, Aune, is this a new comment from you? Yeah, yes, it's yeah. a new comment. Thank you, Berit. And uh, and I, I think you are totally right that uh, that in case of mobility, uh, then the academic merits are maybe not at all the most important uh, topic, but it's the the generic skills and and uh, not so directly academic merits are, are the most important and I think it was actually the initial idea but at least but I, I have how I have understood that the initial idea of uh, promoting uh, this Europeanness or European identity and and intercultural competences is, is the is the main idea of this it's not about learning better math in another country uh, but uh, I was just wondering about your point you said that um, that I, I don't know maybe I quote not directly but that more and more academic people are asking about the value of mobility. Uh, would that mean that uh, that the, these beside effects or, or the non-academic merits are not so valuable? Or because what I see in Estonia is that, uh, that the mobility is stressed uh, mainly and mostly because of, uh, of these, uh, that we understand that when you are staying in the one university, it's, we, are, we have little, we, have, we don't have very good tools in promoting in students the let's say the future skills or, or generic skills uh, because I think they just obtain uh, these skills so much uh, better when, when when putting themselves in the new situations like being mobile or creating their enterprise or going to to do some practical work in the in the community so uh, so applying their knowledge what they have learned in the auditoria 
so so I was just wondering that is this uh, do you see the hesitation uh, towards the mobility like a wider question and 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 how do you interpret that? Well, then I'm sorry if I, I was unclear. I don't see that mobility as such is question. I actually think there's uh, a great acknowledgement of, of the benefits, but maybe more on the non-academic uh, benefits, uh, of which I mentioned some. But especially if you have a, a, a curriculum with very specific outcomes, I have, and that I have done for at least the last 20 years, met academics who are very uh, worried if there are some specific special skills in algebra or something else that are the prerequisite for taking something more advanced that the students uh, do not acquire. So, so it's not a trend uh, of, of moving towards, it, it has nothing I think to do with, with less technology of internationalization, but more um, the backs, uh, some of the backsides. But this is my personal experience. Thanks a lot, Aune. And uh, Beatrice, Sue, do you have a comment as well? Or should we take the next question? Okay, let's move on to uh, Hannah Tange. Good to see you, Hannah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for daring to let me speak because you happen to be hitting something that I'm writing on right now, which is always a danger. But I'm thinking about these things about the competences because I'm challenging Beard a bit here because uh, this automatic assumption that mobility brings cultural awareness. We're actually currently looking into intercultural competences as something that, well, perhaps actually is not supported by mobility where we sometimes find students returning with stereotypes rather than an enhanced intercultural awareness. So we're now looking into, well, actually, as we call it, see where do students develop these competences? And I think we should be careful about automatically assuming that physical mobility is necessary as we are increasingly seeing other means perhaps doing the same thing better and closer to home. For instance, bringing students into parts of their hometowns that they don't necessarily frequent because these parts happen to be populated by, say, a segment of society that uh, university students do not necessarily meet a lot. So I'm just challenging the automatic assumption of what competence we actually associate with mobility, because I think this idea that it automatically brings into culture competences has been exaggerated. And I think we need to carefully look into that. Yeah. Oh, and I'll oh. stop there. Sorry. No, but I, thank you. And it's great that you are doing research on this. I was just quoting what, what, what I read and what I, I hear, and I think you're absolutely right that it's not a guarantee. I think, especially if the international students live by themselves, which is often the case in many places. And what you're describing about using the, the community just around you is a, a, a great uh, idea, and uh, especially uh, a low CO2. Still, I don't think we should... Uh, should should uh, discard uh, international international exchanges, but but it's good uh, that it doesn't come automatically. That was not my point either. Sue, you have a reply as well. Are you still muted, Sue? You need to unmute. I can just back up what Anna has been saying. Um, that uh, we've had a master's student here who did a research on. Um, American students in Denmark and the way in which they um, represented themselves and what they think they learnt during their stay abroad. And it was very much about um, putting pictures of expensive food or iconic tourist sites on Instagram and uh, generating themselves a, a C I simplify, but it was very much creating a, a CV that would be sellable. Um, and uh, I think David Greenwood is here He's done a fantastic piece of work with the study abroad program in Sevilla and written a special issue of the journal Lattice on this, where they rebuilt the whole study abroad program uh, so that it became much more ethnographic and much more learning about the, the society they're in rather than just a superficial, stereotypical type of experience. So I think Hannah has pointed to another topic, which probably we can't cope with today, 
but the, 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 the ways in which the study abroad programs and mobilities are organized, I think is also uh, needs exploring in, in some detail. Well, I just a short comment. This is not about mobility or not mobility, but it's no. like everything else we do to do it well. Yeah, how we do it. Yeah. Right. We have two more uh, comments or questions, and then maybe we should have a break, and then we have a little extra time perhaps for the uh, group work, group discussion. So, uh, uh, Ronald Meyer, you're the first one up. Thank you very much. You know, I really enjoyed these talks. Um, and I would like to, um, to get your opinion on, on the triangle of a Europe, the concept of a European university, the concept of uh, international competences or cultural awareness, and the concept of digitalization. Um, meaning, in my view, that with the concept of a European university, we might approach a time in which the whole study program is actually taking place internationally by digital experiences. Mm -hmm. Some call it collaborative online international learning, but you know there is all kinds of you know uh, um, possibilities and opportunities that many students engage for themselves for each exchange with people from other countries, whether they are living inside their own countries uh, or in the other countries. Digitally doesn't matter anymore. Um, so I was wondering, you know, whether you could share your opinion about you know what this means towards you know the, the general. Um, um, expectations that we have towards international experiences that's, that our students um, engage in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ronald. A bit. Do we have a yeah, and ask, should I like to ask my co collaborators uh, into? Uh, I think the, the alliance uh, opens for something that is maybe very, very important, namely trust building that uh, you can lower the barriers uh, both for how we do things and how we uh, compare things and, and, and also uh, including more types of, of, of mobility. We just heard a good example from Henne about doing cultural awareness at home. It's, it's also, I think, the whole virtual uh, mobility. We, we, the, the, as I see it, it's really we are at a step where we can do something differently. Um, but I should like to, to ask uh, some of my Joe and Aun and Karin as well. Yeah, Joe, do you want to come in? I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to jump in. And, and, and entirely, I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, tr trying to actually stay out, particularly uh, when we actually said, let's go towards a break. But it is really, to me, how we can... Uh, how we can try uh, something different, how we can actually um, get into the point of keep what, what we do well, but also bring, bring this, this, this sort of transformational effect that we want to, these experiences we're providing our students to have. And, 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 and uh, uh, I very much agree with Barry. What we're trying to actually uh, show with the paper is that it's basically moving beyond these binaries of home, abroad, online, offline, uh, sort of here, there. It's basically really trying to think a portfolio of experiences that are made available to the students in, in different times. And, and Barrett, I, I really love the, the, the Big Mac Index. I think it's actually really thinking in a different way. Uh, what is the vision? And, 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 and Susan, I think you actually, Sue, you really put it with the, with the challenges, right? So we actually are giving ourselves, ourselves a challenge to, uh, to redesign uh, the architecture of when this opportunity is made available to the students. And in order to do that, we of course need some standards, but we also know that uh, we also, we need to think how we can actually build on relationships of trust uh, and how we actually can create some spaces when we can risk new designs because otherwise if we can't risk new designs we will continue going round the same roundabout and and um, and we also need to engage what what with what's what the experiences our students have when they they go abroad and and we know that it's 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 very different as you said and and the example of Hannah you gave and and that does happen and the question to me is not that one is better than the other the question is when things happen what what are the outcomes for the student how can students actually 
uh, being in, engaging in experiences that they also have some stackability they can they can build on they can take whatever they do in a co-curricular into the curricular and and, and vice versa there is a lot of rigidity uh, which is not synchronized uh, with the with the world of our students our students live in a much more dynamic environment and 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 we provide quite a lot of that in 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 their curriculum but i think we can actually do much more and we have an opportunity that's how i would like to see the current moment as an opportunity to think with partners uh, in in different ways and if today collectively we cannot make decisions of changing things then then, then how can we actually move things and bring some change into the system? I think that's um, that, that's what I would like to see as, as an outcome to actually go beyond this program is better for that, but to actually say, these are all the programs we have. We know what they do. Uh, we need to articulate what we use them for and what we think we, we get students to do when they engage with those programs uh, and create a different portfolio, a more diverse portfolio of opportunity for the students. Thanks a lot, Joe. And, and we have one more comments. But just to add to that, I would really like also to discuss in, in, in the session after the break how that looks, that what you mentioned here, Joe, in practice. When we move to the student level, uh, that trust, how does that look uh, when students go out and they come back? Because I, I, it's super sympathetic ideas which work definitely on a strategic level. But yeah, do they also work in practice? And how, how, how is trust um, sort of supported or scaffolded it uh, institutionally uh, on a practice level. But Jan, you have a you have a, a, a final comment here before the break. Just a very brief comment about uh, something that Barrett mentioned that I think really is so so fundamental, which is this yeah this mistrust by many academic colleagues when somebody goes abroad that they they might have a good experience but they won't learn X or they won't learn do Y. And I mean, in in, in my experience, there's something really uh, you know, and, and so therefore we emphasize very often the kind of the added value of the intercultural competence, but I, 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 I would still really want to make a strong argument for also for never lo losing the academic value out of our sites, because I mean, in my own experience, having worked in, in degrees where there's been a compulsory year abroad, you know, if you send a student from Germany to England or from England to France, there are completely different ways of create, crafting an argument of doing an analysis in social science and humanities, um, probably different in maths. And, and, and the ways in which students are stretched, this is academic, but it's also deeply cultural because there's something really deeply cultural going on about why this is the case. And if students are able to, to, to master this and then come back, that's an extraordinarily intellectual gain. And, 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 I, and I don't think we've ever really been particularly good at articulating that and, 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 and grasping that. Or at least to my knowledge, I'm sure, I'm sure that the, the professionals here will, 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 have, will have been able to, but I, I certainly haven't seen it. Thanks, uh, Do we have a final comeback to that from Beard or Sue before we uh, have a break? No, we leave that as a concluding comment for now. Let's uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Really great discussion so far, and uh, we look forward to starting up more sort of in-depth uh, group discussion after the break. So let's meet up again at uh, three o'clock sharp, and then we'll introduce to the group exercise. Okay, enjoy your break. We're all back. Uh, hope you enjoyed your break, and uh, now we look forward to engage in further community building and discussion across different contexts. Uh, institutional nationally as well, curricular or disciplinary, uh, probably as well. And uh, I'll start by handing it over to uh, you, Sue, again, to sort of set the frame and introduce to the focus and the questions. Um, and then I can explain more about the um, breakout rooms after. Over to you, Sue. Yeah, thank you. So uh, when we were thinking about how to, to set up a, a group work on rethinking this space that we've so... Uh, well described in, in the earlier sessions today. Um, we were thinking that standards um, are maybe a, a step too far. Maybe the way to start is thinking about indicators because an indicator can be pointing in the direction, pointing to the kinds of things that we're interested in without necessarily trying to jump to creating a standardized process all in one go. So, the little picture here is meant to indicate that if we're going to start working up some new ways of thinking about how we create uh, 
ways of collaborating. It has to be built on a strong foundation of the students and the academics way of, uh, of uh, working. And then the house can be built on top of that. So let me just uh, try and introduce the idea of community indicators. Um, if we think of the university as a community, um, we've got students, academic staff. I should also add in there administrative staff because quite often I'm hearing that the administrative staff are where students often refer when they've got problems or tensions, they should perhaps be added in. But students, academic staff, university leaders and policy makers, but they all have different interests. Um, they're, if you like, different life worlds. So one of the issues we've picked up from, from the report, the Guild's report, was the way in which standards are sometimes experienced as top down, as uh, separate from the context of teaching and learning and of academic work. And um, an aim here might be to try and think about how do we recreate a community, create a common ground between these different life word worlds. So that's one challenge, I think, in rethinking standards. How do we work them so that they have meaning for students, they have meaning for academic staff, they have meaning for the university leaders with their different interests in the way they would use them, and policymakers. So if we move on to thinking about what indicators are, they're indi they indicate what matters for people at the core of an activity. So the core of an activity, I would say, in terms of teaching and learning is the students and the academics understanding of what makes good educational experience. And I suggest that we focus, because um, that's enormous, we focus it down onto education experience of studying abroad or mobility. Um, and then the second step would be to identify things that indicate those experiences of a good education. They would need to be things which are tangible or measurable but yet are embedded in their context. One of the problems with standards is they've been decontextualized, disembedded from context. If, they, if we could come up with some indicators that are embedded in context, then students and academic staff can use them creatively to think about how we improve our practices or how we engage with new practices in the challenges that we've identified today. So we're not looking things for things that are top down and countable, but meaningless. We're looking for things that are embedded um, and improve practices, but yet are tangible and countable. Because the third thing is they need to be translatable between the, between the life worlds. So if students and academics would use them to discuss and improve academic practices, Managers would need to use them in a different way. They've got other work to do with them. And policy uh, makers would use them in a different way. But the question is, how can they be used by each group to talk with the others? So as they move, let me just move to the next slide. We're thinking of, if pick, we, we were focusing on ECTS in this discussion, but let's think about indicators of mobility. We've got nested contexts here of students, academic staff, institutional leaders, and policymakers. If we were to start with trying to find some indicators of valuable educational experiences from mobility amongst academic staff and students, those indicators would need to be used by institutional leaders, and they'd use them in a different way, and policymakers would use them in a different way. But then the policy would come back to the academic students and staff. And the point would be that we need to have something that will travel between those contexts, both up them and down them, so that when they come back to us as teachers or students, we can recognize them and still use, use them. So that's the third point about them being translatable between the life worlds. How can they be used by managers and policymakers in their work and used by each group to talk with the others. Not that they are hard to recognize when they come back to academic staff and students again. 
So this is what we were trying to think of. How do we, if we're moving away from standards in with the critiques that we've developed today, and we're trying to think of alternative ways of creating some kind of indicators that might lead to standards, but some indicators that would show what we're trying to achieve in this new space with these new challenges that are facing us. How do we set about it? So those were the three things that we were thinking were important to start with what matters for the core of the activity, identify things that are tangible and point to what matters and that are translatable between the life worlds. So what we'd like you to do is to have a group discussion and think about what matters in terms of educational experiences of studying abroad or mobility. We've, to, we've, we've moved, the discussion today has moved it to a wider concept of mobility. And here are just some examples. Um, what do students and academic staff consider to be the components of a student's good study abroad experience? Um, what would point, and then the second thing is, what would indicate a good or a bad educational experience of studying abroad? Choose specific things that matter. Now, these indicators can be wacky and imaginative, but they must also be tangible and measurable because they've got to move between, between uh, layers. Um, so how can students and academic staff use them to think about uh, the design of study abroad experiences and how we, how we use them in education, but also how can leaders and policymakers use them? So that's the challenge for the group work coming up now. Does that set the scene, Cern, or do you want to pick up in a different way? That's great, Sue. Thanks a lot. No, I think it's excellent. Uh, least to me, it's clear, maybe because also we've talked about it. <laughs> but, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, the point is that um, we created uh, four groups with uh, five, six people in each group. And we'd ask you to reply to two questions. And there's also a Padlet uh, link in the chat, so you can use the Padlet for um, sort of keeping your notes. And we also have uh, your notes uh, after the event, but also so you can remember what you discussed. And then after the discussion, we'll give you 25 minutes and then we'll call you back and hear from each group. So I suggested you start by maybe introducing um, yourself um, around uh, the table, as it were, um, and then maybe agree on who will uh, be the note taker who will give um, a brief summary and then see if you can if you have time to discuss both questions that would be super helpful and we look very much forward to that so um, I'll send you out into your uh, breakout rooms now I'll stay in the main room uh, here if there is anything you can you can um, you can get back and, and ask but otherwise um, we'll see you again in 25 minutes so have fun all right Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had some good discussion. At least the Padlet seems to indicate that there was a lot of things going on. So I look forward to hearing about that. Um, we have around 15, uh, 15 minutes time or so to, uh, to hear back from the groups. Um, so um, I'd like you to sort of invite you to give a, just a brief recap or summary of some of the most important points in each group and uh, you're, of course you're welcome also to comment on what the other groups say but uh, so let's hear back and um, so the first group um, were Guran, Radu, Ronald, Sue and Suze. Uh, maybe you would give a, a short summary, one of you. Right, so I'm going to do that. Uh, hello. Um, for the rest of the uh, meeting, uh, my name is Radus Dimitrescu, I'm from the Babes Boy University in Romania. So uh, in group one, uh, we noted that we didn't have any students, so we didn't really get a bilateral discussion between or get feedback from the student part. But uh, we agree that contents are uh, really uh, the first thing that matters. and. Uh, it counts towards the uh, degree. Some people would say this is not entirely uh, rewarding. Uh, contents come with a component of uh, cultural, uh, institutional culture. So it's not that you have knowledge, learn to use that knowledge, but you're using something about culture, but not the culture of the country in general, but institutional cultures, other ways to do science, to learn science, to generate uh, arguments. Um, and then speaking of the cultural experience, uh, we 
we thought that um, you could get uh, this um, organized uh, somehow uh, in, say, a sort of diary. And if you look at the uh, Padlet, uh, there is a list of uh, other things uh, uh, one can uh, try or components uh, that can uh, be incorporated into that uh, diary. Uh, and then, uh, so your systemized uh, uh, account of your experience could perhaps uh, be counted as extra work that you do. So you get your uh, ECTS credits for inorganic chemistry or whatever you did uh, uh, in class, but then you're doing some uh, extra work besides just posting your uh, expensive food on uh, Instagram. Uh, if you do that compared to the students who stay at home, perhaps it might be worth to, uh, to receive a credit or at least uh, to know that this credit can be offered uh, to you in perhaps some sort of... Uh, optional uh, way uh, back at your uh, uh, university. Uh, we pointed that, uh, that uh, there are these uh, programs that uh, also really take you by the hand and uh, uh, immerse you more deeply into the uh, culture, the respective culture that you're visiting, such as the civil program that uh, engages you in conversations with the host family. So you have to stay with that one family and then, of course, really uh, enhance your uh, cultural exchange uh, uh, that way. Mm. Excellent. Anything? anything? That, that, that might be too much speaking for me. So perhaps let's hear from the other groups. So that linkage between content and culture and the linkage again between work, you say work, that sort of formal informal linkage um, and the host families. Just to hear a little bit more about the host family. So what, what role do they play and or what role does that play in, in, in relation to, what, what did you talk about in relation to that, if you can elaborate a little bit further? Well, well there was a mention that there is a program, but I didn't make that mention. So perhaps uh, if uh, the person who did that could uh, sure. just in, uh, but there is such a program, uh, civil, uh, they call yeah. it, or civil. Shall I, shall I come in? Right. Um, I was referring to David Greenwood's work with uh, the study abroad program in Seville, right. and and there they um, they have a series of questions or or challenges that they give the students. So, for example, they they live with a family in in the town, and and they have a certain number of things to discuss with that family, and then write about that, and to work with uh, community organisations, and uh, learn about the part of the town they're living in, and write about that. And then we expanded that by um, suggestions of uh, actually writing about the learning culture in the university they're visiting. And we picked up Jan's point about um, uh, arguments being constructed in different ways. So you could set the, a series of questions for a student to, to work on as an absolute exercise whilst they're doing study abroad. We also picked up Hannah's point that they we could get students to do this at home as well. And then we were thinking that that would then need rewarding. It could be examined like a qualitative piece of examination with a grade and rewarded with ECTS. Thanks a lot, Radu and Sue and the first group. Um, let's make sure that we um, go through the entire round. So I want to invite a um, spokesperson from group two and the group two were Aune, Christine, David, Georgi, Ivana, and Jenne. Um, would one of you like to say a few words? Yeah, I, I have to do that. I, I wanted very much David doing that because I think he has a most in, uh, inspiring uh, input in our group. But uh, I can try to do and ask uh, colleagues to, to add. Uh, so first, uh, what to measure we were discussing or our discussion was around uh, uh, three aspects actually about mobility. One was this content, certainly, which is, of course, important content of the of the experience. And the secondly, we content academic content, I mean, and then we talk, told about the generic competencies. Uh, mostly we were talking about language competence, actually, and that is also maybe easy to measure. And then finally, we told about meta knowledge on, on learning and teaching, uh, actually the same that was mentioned in the first group. Uh -huh. So this is maybe something that the students are not so much intending to do, but they what happens uh, if they if they experience other other academic culture. So these three aspects and if uh, talking about how to measure these, 
then uh, then I think this is something that is coming from the idea that David was introducing that uh, that sort of uh, I would call them structured interviews before and after maybe also in the middle but let's say before and after mobility experience and before it could be about uh, discussing what kind of uh, aims what kind of what competencies the student want to obtain during the mobility but uh, and maybe convincing also it's not just about uh, asking what you want to obtain but or what you intend to obtain but maybe also convincing or pushing uh, uh, some uh, some directions and then afterwards it could be uh, asking basically the same questions so what happened and and to see whether the intended and and obtained experiences were the same and and i mean as a as a psychologist i would like to also measure some of these. I mean, I think it's quite easy to measure language uh, development, how, how well your language developed during the experience, but it's maybe more difficult with some of the generic competencies, but I would say that not impossible. And what I found interesting in our discussion was that regarding the content knowledge, we a lot uh, talk about quality. And if we talk about quality, we mean that uh, it should be the same that it's taught in our university. So if, it, if it's exactly the same, then it's of good quality. <laughs> but uh, our Georgian colleague actually stressed that the good quality is new knowledge. So it's something that you can't obtain in our university. So, so it's also interesting, I think, the discussion. So whether you go, to, go there to learn something that is impossible at home or you want to replace everything that is taught at home. So this was our discussion. But if anybody wants to add, I'm welcome, very welcome if you can do so. Thanks, Lana. That was excellent. I, I'm just struggling a little bit about the, the measuring thing because that's a sort of a real you need to measure, but and at the same time there's a risk of maybe reducing or um, sort of uh, stereotyping some experiences or when you make them generic. Who 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 wants to measure? Did you talk about that? Who what what actor is it who wants to to do the measuring in your mm -hmm. discussion? Did you have an implicit sort of uh, measure a role in, when in your discussion? Oh, you're, you're muted now, Aune. Uh, you're muted. Uh, I think we, yeah, we shortly discussed it and because I think from the sort of academics or faculty point of view, it's uh, if you, if you, I mean, if you measure the, uh, the content you measure in ECTS, uh, but the generic skills, I think uh, it's also an important uh, learning outcome, I think of most uh, programs, but it's very hard to, 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 to grasp or to exactly say which courses are developing which uh, competencies. So I think there is an interesting from in interest from the university point of view to see yeah. whether the generic competencies are developing. I think from the student point of view, it's al also useful because uh, the generic competencies uh, uh, tend to be invisible maybe. I mean, I think if I improve my language, then I notice myself. But if I if I become uh, more culturally competent or, or maybe, maybe I even don't... Uh, I mean, maybe I don't know and maybe I don't present it to the employer afterwards that uh, that was the value and that is something that I know now better than the other students do. Mm. And from the politician's point of view, I think uh, if you think about it, it's European money and I think the main aim to put money into this like Erasmus program is to, yeah. to increase this kind of cultural awareness. And if we can show that which, which aspects uh, are develop developing better than then maybe it's like a value for money, or I mean, it's uh, yeah. I mean maybe maybe the finances are more eager to finance if we can show that uh, these are improving. Definitely, so different uh, motivations for measuring and different mm -hmm. maybe interpretations of the ideal purpose behind measuring across the different levels that that yeah. more actors that you talked about. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Thanks a lot. Um, right, thanks, uh, Group Two. Let's hear back from uh, the uh, Group Three. Um, and group three are Beat, uh, Joe, Julian, Quayen, and Ramona. Do we have a spoke? Joan, are you happy to start? And then uh, I, yes. I, I can pick up yes. on the second part. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have a language in our groups, but we have five, five colleagues, um, and we talk about transformational and transformative. Uh, impact. So there's slight difference between the two terms. So I'm sure that Joe and Ed, but transformation are relating to transformation and change in a long run. And we're talking about um, tangible, any tangible change because some changes and some uh, achievement 
may only show after a certain period of time. So that is one of the, but transformative is also one of the element um, that indicating the, the power to change things. For example, students come home and they will look at teaching at home in, in different uh, viewpoint, uh, in different perspective. So that was the, the, the highlight of our discussion in terms of what matter. Um, we're also looking at flexibility, a different mo modality, and it's not a um, specific point in time in your life, in your um, semester, and which year that you have to travel. Um, and, that. and we also ask the question of matter to whom, because even individual a student travel or staff uh, travel, that we also have a personal experience, but also we were given a list of tick box that we need to tick various boxes for institution or kind of, um, so, so uh, the, the, what matters, it matter to whom it also important. Um, then we talk about the, uh, indicators. Um, we have um, um, a lady, Moruna, or, uh, she is uh, actually Erasmus coordinator, so she talked about um, the heavy workloads uh, in terms of paperwork, in terms of uh, application system. So um, in order to make Erasmus um, mobility or any kind of mobility in the future, we need to, build, to develop new packages and certainly less paperwork. Uh, we also talk about... Um, um, trust and trust and, and because um, at individual level as well as just uh, faculty levels and, and institutional level uh, in order to build collaboration and partnership uh, often it comes from a personal uh, relationship and also that bonding would probably last uh, for a long time um, that what we, we would like to have indicator that not only numeric uh, quantifications uh, and we um, just, um, I mean, we discussed a lot of point, but um, uh, this is just a, a, just something that I can I can actually uh, talk more about. And we we start start to talking about values based culture instead of standards uh, measure culture. Yeah. Well, super interesting. Thanks a lot, Kui and, uh, and Group Three. Are there any, any things to add from from other group members? Uh, I think you um, you covered a lot. I think the uh, um, I. I yeah, we don't need to go into too much detail. I think what we actually um, t added a bit uh, is was the the need to actually what matters is very individual. It's a very individual experience, and and we need to actually uh, go beyond the systems that we have, which is a bit of a one size fits all. Uh, but in order to be able to do that, that also. Um, we took a bit the challenge that you gave Ashoran to actually think what it means in practice. So to think of the uh, academic year more holistically instead of things that happen in particular blocks and then how, um, how there can be uh, more ways to bring one experience into the other to actually have this uh, that I, I refer to as stackability or sort of as an opportunity to take something and then build on it and, and continue. Yeah. Um, so I think the current... The, the, the what matters at the moment is not reflected in what, what we have, but it's also related then to the indicators. And I think the relationship of trust, we elaborated a lot on, we have seen best practice really coming where uh, we, tr we trust the, 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 the partner and, and we trust uh, that there is a relationship between the individuals <clears throat> involved uh, in terms of the individual academics, the teams involved that to create those sort of environment where students have the space and the opportunity to engage. Uh, and then we trust the systems in place that mm. are in the other institution, which at the moment uh, we, we don't do. So uh, we actually use very narrow indicators uh, that A, don't capture the experience, but also actually really are, are missing the bigger picture of the point of how we're trying to use uh, deep partnerships for the benefit of the students. Well, thanks a lot. Um, and that notion of trust is really interesting. That sort of keeps coming coming back. I really like that. I, I'm, I'm struck by, you mentioned power as well. And I think that's the first time we talk about power today. And also you mentioned the power to change yeah. and the idea if... Um, mobility or standards can be empowering because often we feel they are making us powerless or at least I think students and sometimes academics do as well that we are sort of 
we lose power when we start. But but may, may, maybe not. Maybe it also a form of empowering. So yeah, I, I definitely like that as well. Brilliant. There's a lot of stuff to uh, to discuss further. Uh, time is running. So let's hear back from this final group before we have to draw uh, the event to a close. And that's uh, Henne, uh, Jan, Matti, Paula, Sergei, and uh, Simon. Hi, so I will be reporting for this group and uh, we started with uh, what matters and uh, certainly is the access to uh, ways of learning or knowledge that would not be um, available at home or in the home institution, but also flexibility to choose what a person is curious about, but at the same time, uh, there can be uh, some big challenges if, uh, for example, a uh, uh, in a new institution, a person who is a student in the first year of medicine chooses fourth, third, fourth, fifth uh, uh, courses, which they cannot follow because they don't have the pre-existing knowledge. It can uh, <clears throat> result in a lot of trouble. Uh, there is important the support that we, we get. Uh, it's very important to to know what we can expect as students who are going somewhere, but, and that the expectations also match the reality. And uh, here is a big role of uh, international coordinators. Um, ideally, this process, um, Hannah mentioned, should begin before the uh, mobility, then do uh, be, you know, the experience uh, abroad is um, something that, uh, where you're actually experiencing something that you've been preparing for, and then later you you, you reflect on it. Um, but there is a lot of challenges uh, and very difficult measure measurements. Uh, first uh, thing that uh, I came up with, what can you measure is the number of Erasmus babies uh, born from uh, marriages of people who met during their Erasmus mobility. That's uh, I've heard something about a million babies being born from that. Uh, but then there are also uh, questions, what can we measure? I've heard from Auna that it's easy to me measure language. Then I heard from Hannah Tang that it's actually not easy or even possible to measure la language capacity. And then I wonder if I come back from, a, from mobility, do I want to be assessed with uh, 150 tests, uh, which I, uh, try to capture my uh, cultural capacities and uh, intercultural communication skills? Um, Jan mentioned that uh, students come ch changed and transformed and it's not only the half a year or year that they would transform in, in while if, if they were would be uh, following a course at home that they come at a home best as a as a more mature uh, stronger personalities uh, but uh, the, the question how that maturity could be um, could be tested or how uh, could we assess that people um, overcame a lot of challenges, personal or academic, on, during their study abroad is, um, is a question. How, how to measure, how to come with indicators. The, uh, the last thing that Hannah mentioned is that sometimes uh, people even come back with uh, more simplistic stereotypes uh, or diminished intercultural comp competence, which we never take into account that it might, might happen. We are uh, usually focusing that it is a positive change, but it actually could be a negative change and uh, we should be open to, to that possibility as well. Is there anything that you would like to add? Super important points. But, well, uh, perhaps we should add just the one thing because uh, what is very important if you're trying to do something that's pan-European is that you explicate what requirements are there for students taking courses. And the example I gave was actually undergraduate, free moving, exchange student being put into a specialized master class in philosophy. The philosophy teacher was very nice about it in the interview, but I think those kind of situations are simply not working. So there's got, you've got to enroll, you need to get the international office, you need to get study administration involved in this. So you actually make it absolutely clear what courses are specialized and what courses are open because otherwise everybody ends up being unhappy. 
Thanks a lot, Henne and uh, Matty and uh, Group 4. Uh, and this um, definitely the maturity, curiosity, formation or building, how to measure that, how to test that. And at the same time, that's also an inscribed logic, you say. It's often a sort of an expectation that there is a formation, that there is a maturation. Maybe there isn't. Maybe something happens during uh, that process that actually leaves a person um, less mature in, in, in a sense perhaps. I think that's that logic that you point to is interesting as well that we seem to take for granted. Okay, so time is actually, thanks a lot everyone. Time is, is really um, uh, up now. I, I just want to say uh, very few words and then I'll hand it back to, uh, to Beat uh, again. Um, we definitely want to follow up if, if, if it's possible in, in some way and if the Guild wants to Uh, to follow up as well we, in Chef, we'd be happy to support that. So how to follow up on this? There are different ideas and we will write you um, an email uh, as well and ask what you would like to be interested in, in participating in, how much time you have, what role you see yourself um, having. It could be follow-up webinars uh, on the suitability or more suitable standards in universities and further discussion in those webinars across levels, as Sue mentioned, that would be very interesting. Uh, a conference symposium, perhaps taking the discussion into a more uh, formal Uh, academic uh, space um, early was this year, so that will not be until um, two years, but it could be, so it could be another conference um, joining in uh, in a symposium across different universities, uh, members of the guilds, for example, doing a special issue on edited volume on the issue of standards uh, could be interesting as well. Maybe some of these things will develop over time as we uh, collaborate further, but um, just to mention this, and we don't have time to talk more about these with you now, but we will follow up with an email. And I think it's just um, left for me to say thank you very much, everyone on behalf of Chef at least. I think Sue agrees that it's been a true pleasure uh, being part of this event and this discussion, and we look forward to, to further collaboration. So be it, uh, yes, the final uh, word is yours. Yeah, and that will be great. Thank you, uh, Sir, and you're a magician when it comes to cheering. Sue, thank you for your fantastic, clever, thoughtful, provoking uh, points and good answers. Uh, and to everybody, thank you for the contributions. I think this was really what we dreamt about, uh, the critical views on, on our preconceptions of things. And then I hope you will join us for the, the next two webinars. Aona, you are still there. Uh, the next one will be uh, hosted by University of Tartu. I've Do you have a, a, a topic? Then you can tell us and it will be available mm -hmm. at the Guild's home page. Yeah, I would like to invite everybody to the next uh, Guild uh, seminar on the, on the same paper. The topic will be about, uh, about uh, how to say, the, uh, what, is the, what are the strategies, national and university strategies to... Uh, towards uh, incoming students. So, I mean, I, I don't mean mobile students, but mainly the degree students from inter international degree students. And what are the national and university strategies to engage them to the local labor market? And and uh, what are the activities? I feel, I mean, starting from language teaching, but also, uh, and I mean, all, all the issues around these, whether international students should stay or, or leave after after the graduation and, and what the universities and countries are doing in this regard. We don't have the date, Yet, but it will be in the second half of November. And as, as Spirit said, yes, we'll yes, invite It will be on the homepage of uh, the Guild, and we'll, I'm sure we can distribute uh, otherwise too. But uh, thank you for a great afternoon. It's most valued. And uh, take care. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.